<laughs> Glory to God. I love this song. Jesus said the words that he speaks are spirit and life. We echo authority. His authority. We echo his victory. You move the mountains. Told the wind and waves be still. You cast
Hallelujah. You know, you can let your seats go. You can come out of your comfort zones. You don't have to, but there's room to step into the river. Let the Spirit of God just fill you up today.
will spring up a well in me to give out, right? To give out the river of water. Some of you are here today, you need a time of refreshing. So the river is there. God doesn't leave anybody out when it comes to his water, his spirit. <laughs> oh, just receive from him today. Just be, just be his daughter. Just be his son right now. That's more, that's, that's everything is being a son and daughter. Hallelujah. Oh 
Dr. David Jeremiah say that Romans was his favorite New Testament book and when it comes to the theology of the church it is paramount and so that's where I'm going to start <laughs> and I have a statement that is not a question wrath or righteousness you will be a recipient either of God's wrath or God's righteousness God does not contrast wrath with mercy, as we would expect. But you understand that His righteousness comes because of His grace and mercy. And so if you're just here as a casual Sunday morning person, and you think maybe someday you'll serve the Lord, I want you to, as Paul said, awake to righteousness this morning. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Get this. The gospel of Jesus Christ contains the righteousness of God through Christ revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness mainly because we want to be our own gods and do what we want to do and we don't want to conform to what God is calling us to do. Proverbs 11.4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath. But righteousness delivers from death. This goes all the way back into the Old Testament, the contrast between wrath and righteousness. Proverbs eleven twenty three: 23, the desire of the righteous is only good. Might not always accomplish only good, but that's our desire. Amen. But the expectation of the wicked is wrath. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I want the day of the Lord. I want Him to return. Zephaniah says this about the day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1.14. I know this isn't popular. Some of you haven't heard about the wrath of God since the Indiana Jones movies because preachers don't talk about it. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and it hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. It is a day of wrath. It is a day of trouble and distress. A day of devastation and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and the high towers. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Your 401k won't mean a thing. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a speedy riddance of those who dwell in the land. As we were studying the book of Romans, the first chapter here Wednesday night, there's this multiple list of the works of the flesh and sins that uh, identify those who live in rebellion against God. And if you get to feeling self-righteous, then you open Romans 2 verse 1 and says, Who are you that judges another? Because if you judge others for their sin while you do the same sort of thing, <laughs> 
you are storing up wrath for the day of wrath. The word wrath and God's wrath is throughout the Scripture. Now get this, God's wrath is not an emotion. It is His holy aversion to all that is evil. We use the word wrath if somebody really loses their temper and they're steaming hot and they're exploding. No, God's wrath is extended toward the wicked every day, but His mercy is extended. What will you be a recipient of, His wrath or His righteousness? Which side are you on? Bible history shows deliverance for the righteous always brings wrath to the wicked. From the Old Testament to the New. How many appreciate the righteousness of God showing Noah grace? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a righteous man in his generation. His family was spared and lifted up above the flood. But the mercy and grace of God to Noah and his family, there was devastation and wrath on the wicked. This is not popular preaching. Let's go to the Red Sea. It's interesting that so much of the conflict I had, we had the privilege of going to Israel in 2019, and I'm so glad we went then. But so much of the conflict, you see so many Bible names there, and, and your, your, your mind is alerted to what the Scriptures say. But the deliverance of the children of Israel from the armies of Egypt the deliverance of them through the Red Sea, understand this, the same path that brought deliverance to the people of God brought judgment and devastation to those who pursued the people of God. Why I didn't hear this morning. Well, I thought God was a God of love. How many of you, how many of you parents love your kids? How many of you have wrath against those things that would destroy your children? Having wrath does not mean that God is not love. Matter of fact, it's part of His love. He hates sin because of what sin does to His creation. All right? So I want you to understand that. And, and at the Red Sea, you see the righteous are delivered and the unrighteous experience judgment. At the Battle of Jericho, the righteous are delivered. And even Rahab and her household, who had mercy on the spies, they found deliverance. But the same thing that brought deliverance to the people of God brought judgment to the enemies. All right. How many remember the Battle of Jehoshaphat? The army surrounded the city. Jehoshaphat sought the Lord. God brought great deliverance. As they praised, they sent forth the worship team ahead of the army. Is that not an incredible story? Praising the Lord and the beauty of His holiness and His mercy that endures forever. And as they praised and as they worshiped, the, the Lord set up embankments against the enemy. And what brought deliverance to the people of God brought devastation to the enemies. Now this isn't popular. Listen to this from 2 Peter 2 verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. I am so tired of so-called ministries that only talk about part of the gospel. You would not need a Savior if there was not a hell to be saved from. You would not need mercy was there not judgment coming to the wicked. You see, we've got to understand that there it's not just, oh, God is this big cream puff in the sky and He just loves everybody and no matter how you live or what you do, someday everybody's going to be okay. I've heard two different ministers say eventually everyone's going to be saved, even Lucifer. That's not true. I wanted to say at this, well... You need to really make sure that you are on the right side. The Apostle Peter said, make your calling and election sure. Okay? Now I want you to understand something. While I'm talking about either you are going to be numbered with the righteous or you will be a recipient of God's wrath. I just want to make it plain this morning. And I want to say this, point number two, self-righteousness is not God's righteousness. You cannot be holy enough on your own. 
and the true statement of righteousness in God is realizing that it's everything He has done at the cross and nothing we have done. But His Spirit calls us to respond to what He has done. In the old church, I would hear people when it came to righteousness say, well, I went to the altar and I sought the Lord and I bombarded heaven until God heard me and then I got baptized and then I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then I started living right. Where's God in all of that? The apostle or the prophet Isaiah said our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And if you think you can make it to heaven by just trying to behave, you're in trouble. Did you realize that the people that gave the most trouble to Jesus were the self-righteous? Amen. You can tell, you know how you can tell if you're self-righteous? It's like at least I don't do what they do. Huh? Oh, you've never felt that way, have you? Watch it. Because when you really encounter God's presence, you're humbled by His awesome presence. You don't come out... Isaiah didn't come out of God's presence saying, boy, I'm holier than everybody else. No, he came out of God's presence humbled by what he had seen by the manifestation of God's power. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God... And His righteousness. Whose righteousness? His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Isaiah 64, 6, I've already talked about. We are like an unclean thing. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. We fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Did you know whatever you give in to as far as sin will eventually capture you and drag you away and destroy you? Romans 10, verse 3 talking about the Jewish, uh, the Judaizers that thought they could be righteous without Christ, for they, unbelieving Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Well, how do I become righteous then? I'm glad you asked. You say, Pastor, this is a 101. This is very simple. This is very basic. Absolutely. I don't want you to leave here with any doubt about which side you are on. Are you his child? Are you not? Okay? The word righteous appears 91 times in the New Testament, 35 times in the book of Romans. Romans 4, verses 2 and 3, for Abraham, if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Would you read this with me? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's a quote from Genesis 15, 6. And he believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. What do I need to do then? You come to God as the Holy Spirit draws you and you realize that when He took your place on the cross, you know why we will not experience God's wrath? Because He took it for us. And when he took my place on the cross, descended into hell, defeated Satan, and arose the third day and ascended to present his blood, now when I come to him and he draws me to him, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to me. And my wickedness and wrath has been paid for by what he did on the cross. Did you get that? 
I want you to hear this. When you're genuinely born again, you won't be perfect, but something changes on the inside and you have a desire to please Him. You have a desire to live right. And you see, we had the cart before the horse. If I can live right enough, if I can do enough good deeds, if I can never miss a Sunday, if I can do all this, then maybe God will accept me. No, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because He has accepted me, now I want to do righteousness and do good works to bring honor to Him. I used to be afraid every time I made a mistake, I'd have to get saved all over again. Where does the Bible say get born again, 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 again? <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask you, how many parents, would you kick your kid out of the family when they made a mistake, did something wrong, or would you correct them? Aren't you glad you're his child? How many has experienced the correction of the Holy Spirit? And how through the Word and through the ministry, God will correct you. So when I make a mistake, I don't have to start all over again. You don't need to keep starting over again. Wherever you fall down, I've used this illustration a lot. If I was walking home and I tripped and fell down, I wouldn't crawl back to where I started. I'd get up where I fell, make it right, and keep walking. I don't want you to leave here insecure. I don't want you to leave here, well, I hope if I'm good enough, God will accept me. No, that's not how it works. If that's how it worked, we wouldn't need the cross. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10, beginning at verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Get this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, not just in your head, in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. I'm so glad I didn't have to get good enough. I've talked to so many people out of church that says when I get cleaned up, when I get straightened up, I'm going to come to the Lord. You've heard me say this a thousand times. That makes as much sense as saying I got to get cleaned up to take a bath. Yes, you come as you are. The fallacy with today's theology, either you have to become all altogether righteous on your own or you think, well, I can come as I am and stay as I am. No, when I get in the tub, I don't get in the tub to stay dirty. Aren't you glad he continually does a work in you through his word and through his spirit? I don't want anybody to leave here today unsure of whether they're going to be a recipient of wrath or recipient of righteousness. Amen. Here's the good news. If you really know him and you're really saved, you are already. His righteousness is applied to you. You say, well, what happens when I do wrong? When I make a mistake, you repent. It's very simple. Here's the difference. Before my nature was changed, I liked wallowing in the mud. You get me? I still slip and fall once in a while. Almost did yesterday. That's another story. <laughs> but I don't enjoy it anymore once the Holy Spirit is in residence. You understand? Because he'll convict your heart, won't he? And so now, according to the Word of God, I live righteously and I do good works because of the Holy Spirit that is within me. It's all His works and then Christ gets the honor and the glory and I just want you to know that you can know that you know that you know that you're saved and you're right with God. Righteousness literally means right standing with God. Amen. Listen to this. Jesus took the wrath, so that we could receive His righteousness. He that knew no sin became sin, that we might be, listen, made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I love the Word. Don't you love a God that loved you this much? Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Aren't you glad it's that way? 
Aren't you glad he gets all the glory? I'm tired of people bragging about what all they've done and how holy they are. Watch out for those eye specialists. That was a quote from my mom. Now watch, by grace you've been saved through faith, that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. For we are His workmanship. Say, so what's that? We don't need good works? No, read on. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When He comes into me, when He saves me, when He purges me and my sins are gone, then I get up and I want to do good things through the Holy Spirit does good things through me. And I do good works not because I'm trying to earn my salvation, because I'm so appreciative of my salvation. Amen. Anybody appreciate that he loved you while you were still a sinner? That he cared about you and you didn't have to get good enough first, but he comes in and begins the work in you, and he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. So, there's a story in the Old Testament where Elijah the prophet is taken up into heaven. There's a chariot and a whirlwind, a chariot of fire, and the mantle falls on Elisha and he goes back to the elders and the elder says, let's send out a search party. Maybe God dropped him in one of, on one of those hills or in one of those valleys. What does that say about their thinking of God? Maybe God sent a chariot of fire and a whirlwind, prepared him for it, just to pick him up to drop him somewhere. <laughs> Tell the person next to you, he didn't pick you up to drop you. Elisha couldn't stop him from looking for him. They wasted the next three days trying to find him. Maybe God dropped him. Listen, folks, if he's picked you up, he didn't pick you up to drop you. Do you appreciate him? <laughs> I want to ask you again. Were the trumpet to sound today, what would it be for you? Wrath or righteousness? Listen, I am in Christ. Philippians 3, 9, this is beautiful. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. What if I showed you Jesus made the same comparison between righteousness and wrath? Would you believe it coming from his mouth? John 3, 36, by the way, all the words of Jesus, because he's the word. He, we all know John 3, 16, don't we? Listen to John 3, 36. Preachers don't read this one out loud. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but what? The wrath of God abides on him. 1 Peter 1.10, make your calling and election sure. Would you stand with me? We're about to open these altars. And I don't want, I want you to hear this. I don't want anybody coming up here and snotting and crying and just begging God to forgive them and save them and wondering if He will. You hear me? Because if you don't believe in what He said, you're wasting your time. But if I can believe that the word of faith is near me, even in my mouth, and I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, there's a transformation that takes place. And I have been moved out of the wrath category into the righteousness category. And as I develop my relationship with God and walk with God and get into the word, then that righteousness begins that's on the inside begins to show outside. Here's a verse that scared me to death when I was young. Ready? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is that in the Bible? Do you know what it's saying? They'd preach that and scare the, try to scare the devil out of me. <laughs> Started to say hell, but somebody might be offended. <laughs> but the next verse says this, For it is God that works in you to will 
and to do of His good pleasure. So the God that works in me causes me to have a holy reverence and the righteousness and salvation that He has put in me. I'm supposed to crucify the flesh, walk with God to what's on the inside begins to show on the outside. That's how you work out. And it's still Him doing the work. Well, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough or not. No, you're not. You never will be on your own. But what he did is good enough. To deny what I'm preaching today is an insult to the cross of Christ and the price that he paid on the cross. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. This is not what I've chosen to preach. Folks, I don't just say, well, I think I'll preach on something. No, I'm saying, God, what, what, what do you want me to share? The day of wrath is coming rapidly. Judgment is already falling in certain ways, in certain areas. And the Bible said it begins at the house of God. Paul said this, get, watch this. Some men's sins go before them into judgment, and some follow after. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm going to send it on ahead. Amen. Because if you don't, don't you ever think there someday you're going to stand before God. The only plea you have is the blood of Jesus. The old church, one thing they did get right, I plead the blood. Hallelujah. So I want to ask you, are you found in Him? Revelation 6, 14 through 17, And the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Whew. The Lamb? For the day of His great wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Somebody got a hold of this idea during the Civil War and they wrote, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has sleuthed the fateful lightning of His terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He's extending to you love, mercy, grace, because God would not be just if He didn't judge and deal with wickedness. But He first of all dealt with it on a cross so you could be moved from the wrath category to the righteousness category. And with that, these altars are open. Make your calling and election sure. Father, I've given what You've given me to share. Lord, it's been a tough week and there's things that don't make sense, but I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. I thank you that I'm your son because of what you've done on the cross through your son to bring me into your family. And God, I ask that people here today would leave here knowing assuredly that you took the wrath to give them your righteousness. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Man, these altars are open. If you want somebody to pray with you, let me know. Someone will pray with you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
Lord, I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah. I'm going to ask you, if you don't know you're saved and you want to be, come up here and let us pray with you. Just come up here and stand and say, hey, so I don't want to go up in front of all those people. He wasn't ashamed to go up that hill in front of everyone for you. Man, don't be ashamed of him here. So if you're not sure, come up here and let us pray with you. Amen. Jesus, go ahead. Jesus. I've got one response. Yes. I've got just one move. That's all we've got. With my arms stretched wide. Hallelujah. I will worship you. Jesus. So I throw up my hands and praise, praise you, you again, again and again. Because so all that, that I, I have is a Except for a heart singing high. 